everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Daline Serfati, and I'm here with Dr. Hilary Humans, who coordinates and moderates this series with me. Well, this is a very special session for me because it's been a year since we launched the MSK case presentation series. The project was conceived with the objective of bringing monthly super interesting cases with great educational content for radiologists all over the world. And today, one year later, I realized that far beyond the learning provided, the MSK case presentation series connected worlds brought Brazilian and international radiologists together and greatly favored the exchange of knowledge and experiences. Thank you so much, Hilary, for believing in this very enriching um, project and helping to make it real. It's been amazing. Many thanks also to Philip Tillman, who is the founder of OCAD, Baron Gamini, also an active collaborator in this partnership, and the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro for the, their support. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Karina, Karina Todeschini, Dr. Yaron Berkowitz, Dr. Eduardo Brown, and Dr. Connie Chang. The speakers will present their cases, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during the presentations, please put them into the chat box, and at the end, the, speaker, the speakers will respond to them. The presenters today, the presentations today will be recorded and available on demand and on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com, and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, if you want to join the OCAD community and see challenging cases almost every day, please consider registering on the OCAD website. Just a reminder, attendees have not been given their permission to uh, screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. I'm authorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding and without further ado, I will kick off the session. We have the pleasure of having here today, Dr. Karina Todeschini. And I am very happy to introduce my dear friend and our mother of a beautiful princess. <laughs> Dr. Karina is a practicing uh, MSK radiologist and medical director of Santa Monica Imaging. She graduated with a degree in medicine from the University of Caxias do Sul in South Brazil with a fellowship, fellowship in MSK Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology at Hospital das Clínicas de São Paulo and a mini fellowship at Centre Hospitalier Universitaire uh, in Lille, France. She's a member of several international and Brazilian radiology societies and an active participant in educational meetings in Brazil. Please, Karina, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, let me put here. Wait a minute, please. Okay. Oh, it's not working here. Let me see. I can see your screen. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, I can see. Uh, okay. It's just, it's my, sorry, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I have a problem here. Wait a minute, please. Oh, here. Okay. That's it. Sorry. No worries. No so, worries. <laughs> so that's the place where I work. Thanks, Aline, for the kind invitation and introduction. Uh, when I was told that my subject would be infection, I went back to the place I did my fellowship where I used to see three or four new cases of osteomyelitis every day and stayed there for one week collecting cases and review, reviewing the archive. So my acknowledgements are Cecilio Baracurimori, who lent me one case and discussed the topic with me many times, Marcelo Bordala and Paulo Vitorelito, who let me dig into the packs from Hospital das Clínicas de uh, São Paulo, and Aline Serfari for this opportunity today. Thank you. 
Today, I will show you three different cases of osteomyelitis in order to discuss the pattern of signal intensity on T1 and T2. First case is a woman, 34 years old, who came with septic symptoms and hip pain. Her MRI showed edema signal on T2 and a confluent pattern of isosignal on T1 in proximal femur, as well as a bone abscess with penumbra sign. A biopsy was made for bone histopathology and culture. Uh, it confirmed the diagnosis of osteomyelitis without granulomas, but culture, uh, culture didn't yield the results, which is the rule in more than two thirds of cases, according to two publications from 2019 by Richel Derol and Juan Derol. So uh, this case was a classic hematogenous osteomyelitis. And why do I say classic? Because the appearance of T1 marrow replacement is crucial for high specificity for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. Uh, this T1 pattern is called confluent pattern. It's a complete replacement of marrow signal in medullary, me medullary distribution, that is low signal in central medullary canal with concordant match uh, high T2 signal, okay? We have a match where, uh, when there is high signal on T2 and dark and confluent signal on T1. So that's classic. It's not a challenge uh, in the proper clinical scenario. My second case, it's a 56 year old man who had a dog bite 20 days ago and received prophylactic antibiotic, which improved ankle edema, but he remained with a fistula draining secretion in lateral ankle and went back to seek help. Here is the MRI coronal T1 and T2 weighted images showing peroneal tenosynovitis and an erosion in lateral surface of calcaneus with bone edema. Here are the axials T1, T2 and post GAD showing the exact path where the canine tooth went. There is a small hole in peroneus longus tendon with synovial thickening and an erosion and edema in the bone. So the diagnosis is consistent with septic tenosynovitis and osteomyelitis by direct inoculation. It's interesting that small puncture wounds are more prone to infection than lacerations and are more frequently inflicted by cats than dogs. Uh, it is osteomyelitis, but we have high signal on T2, and a hazy subcortical moderate decreased T1 signal. This is not a match. The marrow signal uh, is discordant. And here, the third case, we have a diabetic patient with a deep ulcer in his foot. On T2 weighted images, we see edema like signal at the base of third and fourth metatarsals and gas inside the ulcer. Uh, on T1 weighted images, bo bone signal is completely normal. But still, the diagnosis of this case is osteomyelitis by contiguous spread. So we have edema signal on T2, normal signal on T1 weighted images, and that is discordant. I have showed you three cases of osteomyelitis with three different patterns of T1 signal. Almost 100% of pedal and non pedal confirmed cases of osteomyelitis have medullary distribution and a confluent pattern of T1 marrow replacement. Uh, let's review the roots of spread of osteomyelitis because it's important for our understanding of discordant marrow signal. In hematogenous osteomyelitis, we have an infection to the bloodstream. The patient is usually septic, and the typical example is discitis. We call contiguous spread when we have bone infection that comes from adjacent soft tissue or joint infection, and it is favored with vascular insufficiency, as we can see in diabetic foot and immobile patients. And direct inoculation occurs in open fractures, hard venom procedures, bites, and puncture wounds. Here we have some explanations for the exception of discordant signal. First, the imaging workup was done in a very early onset of osteomyelitis. Second, in the context of contiguous spread with vascular insufficiency, it is known 
that vascularity is needed for fat metabolism required to produce confluent and medullary T1 marrow replacement. Um, and in the context of direct inoculation, the rule of open fracture is followed. A communication between the fractured bone and the environment results in contamination. So in diabetic food, clinicians do a test called probe to bone test. Uh, what is this test? They probe the ulcer with a steel probe, and if it reaches the bone, the diagnosis of osteomyelitis is done with high sensitivity and specificity. In our case, the ulcer filled with gas reaches the bone, so it is almost an MRI probe to bone test. Here, the MRI was done for preoperative mapping of the extent of the infection and not for diagnosis. In direct inoculation, we always assume that there is osteomyelitis when bone communicates with the environment. Some authors call this MRI par pattern osteitis, but, uh, an infection of the cortical bone. But ISS went against, against this term in a publication from 2020 because it is misleading and may result in incorrect management. In direct inoculation, it doesn't matter the signal on T1, but the edema signal on T2. To finish, I brought a, re a recent case without final di diagnosis. It is a man, 41 years old, with long-standing skin furunculosis on anterior leg. We see medullary discrete high signal on T2, and on T1, the signal is hazy and faint, but the signal change is subjacent to skin boils without ulceration, as we can see on post-care imaging. So no, no ulcerations here. Uh, there is a publication uh, by Sex et al. from last year that analyzed T2 marrow signal to predict osteomyelitis. This, they found that a marrow to joint fluid ROI ratio of more than 53% to be the strongest risk factor for developing osteomyelitis. So they compared the signal intensity in the marrow to the, the, the flu, uh, joint fluid, and it should be more than 53% to be osteomyelitis. So our case was 41%. Uh, percent. So what favors osteomyelitis in this case? The signal the, is faint, maybe because it's an early onset osteomyelitis. We have infection, the boils, in direct contact to bone. And what favors reactive edema? The signal is very faint on T1 and T2 weighted images. The patient is not diabetic, so there is no vascular insufficiency to explain the poor marrow replacement. And there is a skin infection, but no evidence of ulceration in post-gap images. So what to do? A percutaneous biopsy could cause iatrogenic osteomyelitis. So the best to do here is an interval follow-up, an MRI. My guess is that it, it is reactive edema, but I will follow the case to, to confirm. So take home points. T1 weighted images are crucial for diagnosis of osteomyelitis. Bone edema-like signal on T2 is sufficient for making the diagnosis of osteomyelitis when we see adjacent deep ulcers, which is a positive probe to bone test, and a direct inoculation case because it follows the clinical rule of exposed fractures. For further reading, this reviewing article is very updated and complete. Thank you. In any comments, you can mail me. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Okay, okay, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> It's been a crazy morning. Okay, <laughs> it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Jerome Berkowitz, who graduated from Cambridge University Medical School in 2009. After completing his internship foundation years in London, he undertook his radiology training at Imperial College in London. That sounds so imperial. 
Um, during this time, he spent his last years of training specializing in musculoskeletal and trauma radiology and subsequently completed MSK fellowships at the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Orthopedic Hospital in Oswestry in the UK in 2017, and then at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, Canada in 2018. He's been a consultant attending musculoskeletal radiologist at Oxford University um, NHS hospital since then, and, a, and has a special interest in spine, bone infection, foot and ankle, and shoulder imaging, where he leads the radiology component of the multidisciplinary team meetings. He joined OCAD during his North American fellowship. And uh, I know that was the highlight of his year. And he continues to be a part of and supporter of that community. Okay, Yaro, share your screen. Uh, thank you very, very much for that um, introduction. I'm just checking this works. Has that worked? Yeah, perfect. Ah, fantastic. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, Karina, that's a very hard act to follow, but I'll do my best and I appreciate um, the invitation to speak for uh, to speak to the OCAD group. So I'm going to be presenting really one theme, uh, and that is whether or not it's infected. The Charcot, and everyone's expecting me to say foot, but actually uh, we're going to be looking at the Charcot spine or the neuroarthropic spine. And um, so these pa patients with uh, neuropathic spines are obviously uh, often very complicated and difficult um, edge. They often present with, um, they often come into hospital presenting with uh, signs of sepsis, with raised inflammatory markers because they get chest infections, they get urinary infections, they often have ulcers. And there's a constant question as whether or not the infection is potentially coming from their spine. So I'm gonna show you three cases and then we're gonna try and decide which one is infected. Um, we've got case number one, paraplegic patient. You can see there's uh, distraction of the joints, there's sclerosis, um, of the vertebral body end plates. There's a bit of low, low density, so probably fluid. And there's lots of ossific debris or ossific fragmentation present on the MRI. Uh, and apologies, so the, we've got a T1, T2, and stir signal. You can see significant fluid filling that defect. Um, there's a bit of bone marrow edema in the vertebral body end plates, but also some sclerosis there, which is low signal on both the T1 and on the stir, uh, and edema in the soft tissues. So case number two um, is another neuropathic, so chronically neuropathic spine. They've got uh, distraction, distraction at the L5, at the L45. They've got a little bit of gas. You can see there's sclerosis of the vertebral body and there's some ossific debris um, filling this space as well as low signal, which is probably fluid. And you can see they've also got some mineralization, other features of neuropathic spine. And on the, uh, on the MRI sequences, we can see they've got low T1 corresponding with the sclerosis. They've got significant gas once they've been lying flat for a period of time uh, in that defect as well as fluid. And there's a small amount of bone marrow edema, but not particularly significant as well as um, fluid tracking uh, in the soft tissues. Case number three, um, oh, excuse me. Case number three is another neuropathic spine, more of a neuropathic sacrum. You can see they've got distraction and destruction. There's some ossific debris and a little bit of periosteal reaction here, some increased sclerosis and a little bit of gas present within this defect. And on MRI, they have low T1 and increased stir signal and keeping the bone marrow edema signal as well as fluid within this defect. You can see it quite nicely here on the coronal image, which is uh, sort of midline, the degree of destruction and distraction. So the question is, which one of these is the infected and only one of these is infected? Um, and obviously this is difficult to take to show of hands, uh, but it is case number two. And the question is, how can we tell? So there's a lot of overlap if you look between neuroarthropathy and osteomyelitis in terms of the descriptions, and this applies for all areas. 
So it's mostly been described in the feet trying to differentiate Charcot uh, foot versus an osteomyelitic foot, but it applies the same principles applied to the spine. You can have variable density. So you can have either lucency if they're currently fracturing or sclerosis if it's chronic. And that also goes for osteomyelitis if it's uh, acute and destructive versus chronic. You have a degree of destruction in both. You have debris in neuropathy. You have sequestry in osteomyelitis. You can have distension in the joints in both cases because you can get an effusion or you can get fluid filling the spaces. You just dis disorganization in both cases as you get increasing destruction, dislocation, distraction. So one of the differentiators that people discuss in the foot is the distribution or the location of these, of these areas of edema. Now, in a foot, you'd expect it to be more in the midfoot. However, and sorry, you'd expect neuroarthropathy to be in the midfoot, but um, osteomyelitis to be more in the pressure bearing areas. So the, the forefoot or, the, or the, um, the heel. However, in the spine, both areas um, favor the lumbar spine and the sacrum. So we can't use that as an, a differentiator. But what is very specific is the presence of collections rather than just um, fluids so abscesses and collections and sinus tracts. So if we look at our case, we have, so we've got T1 and STIR signal sequences side by side. Now, back, which is saturated in fluid is the big giveaway. And um, so we've got, as you can see, some myopath myopathic signal change in the soft tissues as we come across. There's this defect we're talking about and the vertebral body is destroyed. That's probably from the neuropathic spine. But the key thing is that there's this sinus tract going through the soft tissues. And you can see it very nicely here, extending from this defect into the soft tissues. And it's obviously discharging. And the gas is probably from free communication. So as they lie down and they distract this fracture, or, or sorry, distract this, uh, this area of destruction, they get a vacuum phenomenon, negative pressure that's being sucked in there. They have it to a much lesser extent um, in simply a neuropathic spine, but it wouldn't be to this degree. And again, the T1 and the SIR signal shows significant edema in the surrounding soft tissues. And if we look at a contrast enhanced imaging, so the sequence will show the fluid, the contrast enhanced imaging shows some enhancement of the tract leading down to skin and of the capsule. If we look at a T2 versus a T1 fat saturated with contrast enhanced image, we can see that the capsule and the soft significantly enhance around this fluid. And that's to a much greater degree than you'd expect if this was, um, if this was quiescent. So there's probably, an, there's an active process, this is active infection. And we can see, we can appreciate fluid, complex fluid, but fluid tracking down through the sinus tract. And again, on a, a, an image slightly further down, these are psoas abscesses. So we've got collections in the psoas, which are significantly wasted because this patient's paraplegic. Um, with rim enhancement. Now, if we compare that to case three, which was not infected, this is another, this is a neuropathic, this, this is an acute neuropathic or acute shock. It's being chronic, but they probably had some micro fracturing they're getting some debris or destruction going on whilst they're sitting down, hence the degree of bone marrow edema. And they can even get enhancement of that capsule and enhancement of the bones um, and of the surrounding defect as a result of the acute Charcot. Now, if we look at the literature, there are specific features that people have described trying to differentiate spinal neuroarthropathy and discogenic osteomyelitis. However, if you've got a neuropathic spine, it doesn't necessarily help you identify whether or not that neuropathic spine is infected because people discuss um, the location for neuropathy being uh, often involving the facet joints, but that not being the case in discogenic osteomyelitis, which is true in a native spine, but not necessarily in a neuropathic one. And um, people also describe there being peripheral disc enhancement versus diffuse disc enhancement. Um, again, not helpful if the disc is completely destroyed. Vacuum phenomenon within an existing disc is described. Um, 
We can, some people describe the degree of destruction as being greater in osteomyelitis. Again, not very helpful if there's pre-existing neuropathic joint. Um, and it's usually, obviously in, in osteomyelitis, it's usually lytic because we've seen them acutely. However, you can get these chronic indolent established infections with low grade infection, which are being suppressed with antibiotics or recently treated. And those can become quite, cro quite chronically sclerotic. Then in terms of differentiating simple collections from abscesses, I think contrast is actually quite useful as well as looking at the thickness of the capsule. So we generally avoid contrast in the UK, but um, well, to a greater extent than, they, than we do in the rest of the world, but it definitely has uses in terms of looking for abscesses in the soft tissue and also higher sensitivity in detecting sinus tracts. And it's interesting. So Karina showed some pictures of um, people probing and so MRI, our sinus tracts are the equivalent of probing the skin um, because obviously no one's going to probe all the way into a defect, but the MRI will demonstrate that. And that open communication, there must be infection going on, even if it's suppressed to some degree. And ultimately, if there's an ongoing question, you can always biopsy or take an aspiration of, of fluid and see whether or not it grows. And that does need to be deep fluid to avoid contamination. We would normally recommend the patients are off antibiotics for that sampling for at least 48 hours, but preferably two weeks. So in summary, you know, if we're looking at a uh, neuropathic spine or charcoal spine versus infection versus a charcoal spine with infection, there are very similar features. There are differentiators described, but it doesn't always, it's not always helpful. So the most important things to look for are the clinical picture, sinuses, the abscesses, um, and how the pa patient is presented. And if you need to, you can biopsy for organisms. It is important to remember that in an acute Charcot, there can be bone marrow edema and there can be inflamed tissue without there being infection. And those are often the very difficult to, um, to decide on cases. And sometimes you just need to follow those patients up or essentially go to biopsy. Thank you very much. There'll be questions at the end, I'm assuming. Yeah, questions at the end. Thank you, Yaron. Okay, let's move on to the next guest. So the next speaker is Dr. Eduardo Brown. He's a practicing radiologist at Fleury and at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. He graduated with a degree in medicine at the State University of Rio de Janeiro with a med medical residency in radiology at the same university. He's one of the coordinators of the monthly session of the Brazilian Orthopedic Society and an active participant of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro, helping bring education among Brazilian radiologists. Please, Eduardo, take it away. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Eleni, for the invitation. It's a big pleasure for me to be here. Can you see my screen? Yeah, but it's not in presenter mode. What about now? It's Is that okay? Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I hope you enjoy the case that we will present today. It is a 35-year-old male. He was complaining of pain on the right forearm and on the left leg for three months, and he had no other symptoms. His first exam was an ultrasound, and these images are a courtesy of my colleague, Professor Mogami, who works with me at the university. This is the right owner at the level of the diaphysis. We can see cortical irregularities with soft tissue thickening here on the axial plane and also on the longitudinal plane. Uh, with Doppler, we can see increased flow in the periosteum. And this is the left tibia at the level of the diaphysis. We can see some pretty similar changes here with cortical irregularities and soft tissue thickening. Uh, again, with Doppler, we can see increased flow in the periosteum. That's the longitudinal plane. And again, with Doppler, increased flow in the periosteum. On the right forearm x-ray, the lesion was not conspicuous, but maybe we can see some small cortical irregularity here on the ulna. 
And the left leg x-ray, it looked normal to me. I cannot see any lesion here. So this is the right forearm MRI on the axial plane at the level of the diaphysis. We can see T1 above and spur below. So that's the owner. We can see uh, some inflammation here with periosteal edema, uh, cortical irregularities and bone marrow edema. And we could also identify a similar lesion on the radius right here and here. That's the coronal plane. You can see a lot of inflammation here with periosteal edema, bone marrow edema, and again on the ulna, and again, and also smaller but similar on the radius. Uh, left leg MRI, this is T1 and STIR. We can see inflammation here at the distal diaphysis of the tibia on the coronal plane. And on the axial plane, uh, very similar lesions like with uh, periosteal edema, cortical irregularity, and bone marrow edema. And again here. In our institution, uh, leg MRI protocol, we always do bilateral imaging for comparison. So we could identify a smaller but very similar lesion on the right tibia right here although he had no pain on this region. So CT scan, we can see periosteal reaction, cortical irregularity on the ulna and radius. And again, bilateral on both tibias um, with periosteal reaction more prominent on the left where he had pain. Um, in fact, at this time, we still did not know what the diagnosis was. And after some months, the patient complained of blurred vision. And he underwent a fundoscopy and the ophthalmologist suggested the diagnosis. He said it was typical of syphilis. And this diagnosis was confirmed with serological tests. So that's acquired syphilis. There is a three-phase clinical evolution. Uh, primary phase is the genital ulcer, the canker. After some weeks or months, we have the secondary phase, and that's the hematogenous dissemination. The treponema travels through the blood, and it can go anywhere. So the patient may have fever, rash, lymphadenopathy, hepatitis, splenomegaly, anterior uveitis, and some muscle skeletal manifestations. I will talk a little bit more about this on the next slide because that's exactly where our patient was. Okay, um, after that, even without treatment, uh, the patient can become asymptomatic, even without treatment. So that's the latent phase and it can last for years, decades. And finally, late syphilis will have the tertiary phase with neurological, cardiovascular and muscle skeletal complications like tibetic, neuropathic arthropathy and yamatose disease. So let's have a look a little bit more on the secondary phase, the hematogenous dissemination the mechanism of bone involvement is parachetal invasion of the periosteal vascular beds, which leads to inflammation and granulation tissue formation. So that's exactly what we can see here on STIR image, all this periosteal inflammation, periosteal edema, and periosteal reaction. And the extension into the vascular channels causes um, osteitis and osteomyelitis. And we can see that here, this small tract going all the way into the bone marrow. And here we see bone marrow inflammation, bone marrow edema. So that's what happened with our patient, uh, periosteitis and osteomyelitis.
less frequent in this phase, we can also see arthritis, myositis, tenosynovitis, and bursitis, but that's very rare. This is a systematic review of the literature of bone involvement in secondary syphilis. Let's have a look at this table. So age, usually the patient is a sexually active adult because this is a venereal disease. HIV co-infection is common, 30%. Recent history of genital ulcer, look at that, only 14%. So it is very important to say that we should not expect a history of genital ulcer to think on this diagnosis, okay? This is important. Uh, sites, the most common affected bones are long bones of the limbs and skull, followed by rib, clavicle, spine, and sternum. X-ray has a low sensitivity, only 62%. And bone scintigraphy has a very high sensitivity, 100%. And I believe MRI should be pretty similar to that. Multifocal bone involvement is frequent, 73%. And this is a companion case from the literature. We can see cortical irregularities here on the tibia and on the ulna, which is similar to our case. Not a companion case, you can see here an erosion with curiosity reaction on the tibia, uh, similar to our case, our case. And a lesion in the iliac bone and clavicle. That's another companion case from skeletal radiology. We can see bilateral lesions in both tibias, and that's very similar to our case. This is just an example of a lesion at the skull. We can see the osteolysis with this warm eating appearance, which is classic of syphilis. This is an unusual case. We can see lesions in situ at the dense of the axis and situ at the spinal process consistent with osteitis. And we can also see soft tissue contrast enhancement. Another unusual case, uh, osteitis lesions at the second and sixth thoracic vertebra. And so that's it. Syphilis is a disease with a myriad of presentations, and it's called the great imposter or the great simulator due to the big variety of symptoms. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. This is a very, very beautiful case. I remember the first time you showed this case to us in our monthly meeting. And everyone was surprised with the diagnosis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm back and I'm here to introduce Connie Chang, who is a native of Boston, completed medical school in New York City, okay, and then returned to Boston for residency and has stayed. She fell in love with musculoskeletal radiology, especially the medical side of MSK, meaning tumors and infection, and she's focused her clinical and research efforts on interventions related to these diseases. She's also the MGH Fellowship Director and has loved this role more and more over the years. She thinks it helps her keep uh, her finger on the pulse of the current state of radiology and how it's evolving. Connie first got to know me through OCAD, and she told me that her most uh, memorable time is being chained and jailed with fellow OCATers for an hour. Um, Yaron was in her jail cell. I'll tell you about that another time. Uh, she's honored to be here and looks forward to getting to know the Brazilian musculoskeletal community more. 
she saying she can't mute unmute herself? I will ask the person from the society to unmute her in Portuguese. So, Milene, você está aí? Pode, por favor, desmutar a Connie, que ela não está conseguindo fazer isso. Fazer isso. Milene, você me ouve? Ok, eu acho que funciona. Sorry about that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> nice I think she was trying to prevent other people from unmuting themselves, but I got I got included in that group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you for the the warm uh, introduction. And yes, ask Hillary later about that story. Um, and uh, I just really want to thank OCAD and the Brazilian Radiological Society for inviting me to present. I'm I'm very excited. Um, so prior to this presentation, I did check with Hillary and ask her if it would be okay if I tried something a little bit interactive um, with the group, and she thought that this group might be up for it. So I'm going to do a trial run. Um, what I would like to do is I'm going to have questions throughout, and I would love for people to put um, things in the chat box. So we're going to do a trial by just having people put in their favorite color, like I'm going to put in green and see if other people, I don't I just want to see how many people, all right, getting some answers, awesome. Woo! Hi, Ron. <laughs> all right, awesome. Okay, so we have people out there. Thank you so much for participating. So I'm going to look forward to you guys participating. All right, so I'm going to focus on, a, on one case, and uh, he's a 53-year-old man with progressive bilateral ankle erythema and edema over one month. He doesn't really have any other past medical history. He doesn't, um, you know, no other important story either, you know, no trauma, anything. But, um, and it began on the left side and then it quickly moved to the right side. So he saw all these orthopedists. And of course, you know, the first thing they said was you must have a fracture. Um, and they did do some radiographs and you can see that there's bilateral soft tissue swelling. And what they were seeing as fractures, maybe here there's a little bit of irregularity at the distal fibula. Um, maybe some other small ossific fragments. I don't know. They thought maybe he has fractures despite there not being any history of trauma and also bilateral presentation. Um, but anyway, so they tried um, some immobilization. Must have been tough with both legs being immobilized. Um, didn't work. Uh, tried some physical therapy. Didn't work. Um, and so, you know, of course, now they're thinking back and thinking, hmm, bilateral presentation. And also, of course, we know this is an infection conference, so maybe we should think about infection. Um, the ESR and CRP were also quite elevated. So um, the problem was, though, there was no fever, chills, no sort of systemic symptom, um, nothing interesting from like the history in terms of travel. He didn't report any like recreational drug use. There was no white count. So the ESR and CRP are up, but no white count. So they also, as a result, worked him up uh, for a Lyme and rheumatoid. Um, Lyme in our part of the, the, uh, the world is endemic. Um, so we see this actually quite commonly presenting as sort of a, um, you know, seeing as tertiary Lyme, even people who completely missed it. So all very reasonable, um, but all of this was negative. So uh, because they doesn't, there didn't seem to be a clear evidence for infection, they did trial some steroids, but there was no improvement. And this poor guy just kept getting worse and worse. And at one point, he could no longer walk or manage his ADLs. So this is your opportunity to put something in the chat box. At this point, are you interested in any particular history or imaging from this patient to kind of help figure out what to do next? I'm keeping my eye on the chat, see if anybody has any thoughts. So this poor guy can't walk, can't do anything. Nobody has answered for him. Imaging, of course, imaging. What kind of imaging? <laughs> uh, MRI. MRI, of course. We love MRI. <laughs> MRI, of course. Some history. All right. So the first thing they, uh, that would be helpful is also to take a look at those ankles. So we're going to do that first. So take a look. These are the pictures. All right, so keep that in the back of your mind. We'll come back to what we see here a little bit later. There are some distinctive findings and this is both sides. So this is the left and this is the right side. All right, so I'm gonna be scrolling through the MRI and I'll, um, we'll go back over these again, but I'm gonna, um, if you see findings of the MRI, point them out, okay, through the chat box. And I will sort of circle 
and pause on some things. You guys can feel free to add them to the chat box. I see somebody asking about uric acid levels. That's a, that's a good question. However, uh, well, on that side, it's a little bit unusual because we're gonna be imaging both ankles. So take a look at this. Yep, there's definitely erosion. All right, look here, look here. Do this again a little bit better here. Okay, so that's the left side and we're gonna be imaging the right ankle now. All right, we see tons of synovitis and a lot of synovitis, multiple areas, exactly. So this is the right side and we see something pretty similar here, only on the lateral side here. These are the perineals. See this here? All right, so the basic summary is that we see bilateral involvement, there's tenosynovitis, um, and there's, um, there's arthritis involving multiple joints, multiple sites, so sort of bilateral, a little bit asymmetric. Okay, so that's what they saw on MRI. So what test do you wanna order next? Here, you're right, okay, that's a good one. Aspiration, you're on, I'm on, I, I like your vibe. Anything else? So I'm actually not sure if they did serum urate or not, um, but my hunch would be it's gonna be normal. So we did do an aspiration and of both, uh, of the right-sided perineal tendon sheath fluid because it looked like that's where the most fluid was. And there was a prelim result immediately that came with gram negative diplococci. Don't know if that uh, rings a bell for anyone. <laughs> Thanks. I like in Brazil, a test for, I can't even say that, chikungunya virus. That's awesome. All right. So given this preliminary result, this comes back within hours of you doing aspiration, what should you ask the patient at this point for additional history? Oops, I hope that didn't show. All right, excellent, I love it, exactly. So he's had multiple sexual partners and some of them were unprotected. Hmm, I'm not really sure why, but that was the history. And um, one year ago, he did have gonococcal urethritis and it was treated with IM ceftriaxone. And so immediately he was started again on ceftriaxone and we were awaiting final cultures. And are there any additional tests that you would do at this point, given this patient's history? Bingo, awesome. I like what everybody's thinking, exactly. So we would do HIV. Um, also, you would check for any other sexually transmitted diseases, so syphilis. It's almost like Eduardo and I coordinated, but we did it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and do some hepatitis testing, exactly. Screen for other STDs, I love it, guys. So over the next few days, um, the final culture came back and indeed it was gonorrhea and uh, orthopedic did a washout of both ankles and all the photos tendon sheets. Um, he is HIV positive and his CD4 count was close to 209, so not good. But the good news is five years later, he's doing well. He's back to running. He's back to normal activities. His CD4 count is doing pretty well and he's um, almost back to normal essentially. So I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and so the final diagnosis is disseminated gonococcal infection as an initial presentation for HIV. He doesn't quite meet the criteria for AIDS, but he's pretty close. So. Um, so disseminated gonococcal infection, um, gonococcal infection is the second most common sexually transmitted disease. Disseminated infection is relatively rare. You don't see this very often, but since gonococcal infection is pretty common, you should keep this in the back of your mind um, as a possibility of something that you might see. And so because it's a hematological um, infection, you get multifocal septic arthritis. This is what we had here. So on the left side, we had paleonavicular joint, tibiotalar, and the subtalar joint. And on the right side, we had calcaneo cuboid. And then we also get tenosynovitis. This is a huge hallmark. So keep that in mind. If you see it on the left side, we saw the flexor and extensor tendons. And on the right side, we saw the flexor and perineal tendons, the bright perineal, which is the ones that we did the aspiration to make the diagnosis. The other key finding that you see is skin lesions. And this guy really has them all. So early on, you have Pusikia. Actually, I'm not sure he has those at this point. But then you start getting papular um, findings, which are more flat. 
and then eventually, uh, eventually you get pustules, which progress to eschar, and then you can have bullae. So he has this on the right side, um, and then uh, and then eventually you see necrosis. Um, and then the, the onset can be quite insidious. So that's what happens to this guy. It kind of slowly drifted in in weeks to months, and obviously he went through sort of multiple hoops, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. Um, it can be delayed after the exposure. So there's a case report which um, the infection occurred uh, more than a year after the most recent sexual activity. Now, I don't know how much I, how much I, um, how much I believe that necessarily the whole year, but um, just something to think about that it doesn't have to be within the last few weeks or even months potentially to have this infection. Um, the disseminated gonococcal infection has gotten very rare in the since the 1980s since um, cetraxone has been used. And as you can see, he did very well with the treatment, so the response is fantastic. Um, however, there has been a recent slight uptick and the CDC, which uh, is the Center of Disease Control for the US is a little bit concerned. Hopefully there isn't sort of developing resistance because of all the cetraxin that's being used. Um, so that's my case. Um, thanks for your attention. Of course, if you have any questions or concerns, um, please give me a buzz. And I thank everybody for participating. That was super fun. Yeah, there was this. Thank you, Connie. This was the first time we had an interactive session, and I love it. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. So, Hillary, I think you have a question for Karina. Yeah, uh, it's behind all these blues. I have to find. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Connie. Um, so, Karina, what do you report when, I mean, you you describe something like this, but I, I see cases in the foot, you know, especially at the toe, maybe, where there's a ulcer or sinus tract clearly going to the cortex and the marrow signal is normal. So, um... When the ulcer is deep and I can see it reaches the bone, I, I report osomyelitis. As I said, for the clinician, the diagnosis is already done and the MRI is done for, to see the extent of the, the infection. Okay, so regardless of the marrow signal, we see the yes. chest goes to bone, that's it. Yeah, we had a, a colleague from Hospital das Clínicas de São Paulo who wrote a paper about diabetic foot and correlation with clinical data, especially the prone to bone test. Unfortunately, he didn't publish the, the paper, but the correlation was very high, very high. I can't remember. I think it was, uh, there was a, a Society of Skeletal Radiology meeting maybe about five years ago. And I think it was the group from Hershey, Pennsylvania. And they looked at a series like that. And I thought they said that when they saw that, um, there was osteomyelitis approximately 50% of the time, which, oh, think... which actually changed the way I reported things. But I was curious, now you're saying you just, if you can probe to bone. Yes, it's uh, at least in that publication I put in my presentation, it was more than 80%, I think. It's, it's Connie, were high. you in the room? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Ah, can't hear you. He's muted. Kenny, <laughs> speak. Ah, he's, she's muted. She is muted. I asked to unmute. I can't unmute her. I'm okay, tired. I'm back. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay. I, I will not unmute myself. I will not mute myself anymore. <laughs> I remember that presentation, but I don't remember the number. Um, my personal practice, though, is that if it looks like the gas is sitting on bone, I think they effectively have to treat it because it's like an open fracture, right? I mean, even if right. you don't yeah. see signs of infection right. yet, made, it's going to that be. Point. But, but I'm just conflicted because of that study. Okay. And I had one more question, which, I mean, obviously they had this information in Connie's case. When you have equivocal cases, I mean, this is to anybody. Do you recommend correlation with DSR and CRP? Do you find that to be helpful? I mean, if that's normal, will that influence your, you know, conclusion? It's difficult to have clinical history from the patient, but I talked to some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, in a perfect world. Yeah, yeah, right. oh yeah. But they told me that a high 
ESR and CRP have a quite good sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of osteomyelitis instead of soft tissue in infection. But I, I, I don't know the number and... And how about um, negative predictive value? Kenny, do you know that? I mean, if it's in the normal... I don't, range. I don't know the numbers, but I can tell you I had this one case of a guy who got a spine injection and got ended up having what was a post-spine infection Normal, like young, healthy guy, no, you know, HIV, nothing, because they ended up working up for this, but the ESR and CRP were normal and it was infected. So nothing is a hundred percent. I think you have to put it all together. I think it's one of those things is, yeah, they do have high sensitivity specificity and, and I think relatively high negative predictive value, but nothing is a hundred percent. So you got to go yeah. with the whole picture. And if you think you need to biopsy it, you just got to go for it, you know? And uh, the, uh, this paper uh, of prone to bone test, it's the, the, the results sometimes are like they, they correlate to biopsy. Uh, the gold standard uh, is very different from one another. And that's the, the why the, the results are different, like 50%, 80%, some papers. So, uh, but I think the correlation is, is very high. Hey, we have another question from the from Oladan Ogunkil. Uh, so from he says from so from what I understand from Dr. Scarina's lecture is that in a diabetic patient, you don't necessarily need medullary low T1 signal as long as there is high T2 stir signal in the presence of adjacent ulcer. So it's okay to call osteomyelitis and not reactive edema. Uh, if the ulcer is very deep and reaches the bone, yes, we at least at Hospital das Clinicas, they, they call osteomyelitis with a high uh, correlation uh, result. There's another question from Dr. Paulo Noronha. It's for Dr. Yaron. Does DWI help differentiate infection on the fluid collections? Um, yeah, I mean, that, so there are, there are papers written about the use of DWI, and I think it's, just, it's well established using DWI in neuroradiology to um, try and identify abscesses. I don't think it's necessary, so to speak, in, um, in patients, if you give contrast, I think that that's very helpful to, to differentiate collections and abscesses versus simple fluid. Um, in a neuropathic spine, a lot of the time you've got so much simple fluid in there from the fact that you've got a defect that if it gets a bit infected, if it's got a low grade infection, it's not necessarily gonna restrict from the DWI. So I don't, I think there's a lot of debate essentially around its use. It's probably helpful when it's um, significantly restricting, um, but not particularly helpful if it doesn't. It doesn't, I don't think it, I don't, I certainly wouldn't rely on it. And we don't use it a huge amount in uh, generally in, in soft tissue lesions and things, so. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions here. So with that, I will thank you all for joining us today in our commemorative session, one year. Uh, and thank you, see you next month. I think it's sport, a sports, sports imaging session next month. And I will let you all know on our uh, on Instagram and also on Twitter. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>